The present Holy Father has been giving an answer to a plea that has been issued more than once in the last two, year, uh, two years, that we need to have an analysis of all of the documents of uh, Vatican II to see what their particular doctrinal value is, what, which ones have a certain value, which ones have no value what's, uh, what's, whatsoever. In fact, the Holy Father has already been doing this, and he's been doing it in relationship to the key points, you might call them flashpoints, like the biblical, the liturgical, the ecumenical, and the, doc uh, and, the, uh, and the doctrinal. And in every instance, he accepts the council fully, just as his four predecess uh, predecessors, Paul, uh, uh, well, basically we say John the 23rd, and Paul the 6th, uh, uh, John Paul the 1st, John Paul the 2nd. If we're going to suggest, therefore, that Vatican II has to be rewritten, has to be revised, cannot be accepted in the sense that you are free, free, very free, as it were, as long as you're respectful, you are free, as it were, simply to re reject it if you're convinced that something else is the better way. Obviously, that, uh, that, uh, that, that cannot be the case. And it's quite obvious that if someone proceeds, proceeds on this direction, they will end up, as it were, exercising private judgment, just like the reformers 500 years ago. And Protestant reformers, that was the key issue. That's what fueled the whole, whole thing, private judgment. We are the ultimate uh, uh, judges of what is and is not, uh, is not re uh, real. That's not the way Christ organized the church, and this is not the way we shall find ourselves, uh, ourselves to salvation and uh, identify the only path, the right path to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to follow. Essentially, Paul VI in 1964 in, uh, said the same thing about the documents that he was in the process of approving with the signatures of all the other, uh, other, other, other bishops on, uh, on them. And to, to my recollection, there was hardly anybody who took exception to them. There were no reservations. Everybody signed, including Archbishop Lefebvre. Afterward, they began to change their mind. But it was on the basis of an opinion, opinion coming from those who held, held, held that Vatican II was an absolute tragedy. There was never a tragedy li like it. Vatican II, in fact, uh, in fact uh, destroyed the tradition broke the tradition, was the final ratification of the French Revolution. We may say, as I say, that in, in the address to the Roman Curia in 2005, the Holy Father pointed out the basic point. Yes, we have to accept it as uh, 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 accept it in faith. That, that we are obliged to reverence and accept all, all, all the points made in the Council, including especially that vision. This is the point that they are saying, as it were, is innovative, has no, has no doctrinal authority whatso uh, whatsoever, because it's purely pastoral and its usefulness is out, has been outlived. The famous Verbum Domine, the prosynodal document of this, of this year, where the Holy Father points out quite clearly that it is not true that Pius XII uh, in Divino Flate Spirito in recognizing the legitimacy of the use of, of literary uh, uh, genre contradicted Leo XIII in Providentissimus Deus. What Leo XIII was point out the supernatural char uh, character, but he did not deny the importance of the instruments which you must use to understand it. I don't think anyone would try to study the Hebrew scriptures of the Greek New Testament without a dictionary. But the fact that you can use a dictionary doesn't give you the meaning of scripture. This is the point the Pope is making const constantly. Yes, it's useful to study literary, literary genres, it, it form, his, uh, form, critical, uh, uh, for, form historical criticism is useful. It's very helpful. It doesn't make us relativist, but it will not tell us the meaning until we have that additional, additional uh, factor that comes from the influence of the Holy Spirit in so many different 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 ways. Ways. In his letter, as it were, to the bishop of the whole church in last last year, two o o nine, concerning the difficulties and the in the conversations with the traditionalist rep represent, he pointed out once again, cannot resolve the problem. You cannot have full con communion with the church today unless you accept Vatican II, period. First you accept it, then you will seek as were help to understand what exactly it means. And you will see that it doesn't mean anything, anything at all, uh, uh, at all that contradicts tradition. 
but it's also true that it provides, as it were, not only for these past 50 years, but for a long time to come, as in all the great, uh, great councils, uh, guidelines, guidelines for advancing towards the final coming of our, our, our Lord. And I think that's rather important, to, important also. Continuity in view of renewal. No rupture in order, as it were, as it were to preserve or to, uh, to uh, radically depart from the tradition, whichever, uh, whichever negative position you, to, you think is the better one for you. The, uh, the traditionalist or the modernist. This is the point, point that we must keep in, keep in mind. The Holy Father has uh, uh, touched biblical, ecumenical, the liturgical, you know, from Suborum Pontificum. It is not his idea to suppress the ordinary form. But it is an idea that the ordinary form should be seen more intimately, especially because it is the adaptation of the private mass, the low mass of all, in relationship to the tradition, and not as so many people uh, uh, see it in a superficial way. And that's not such a hard thing to uh, do if you study very carefully. The few things that seem to obscure that point can easily be, be, be dropped. On the other hand, the Holy Father keeps pointing out in his Regensburg Address of 2006 that uh, history is full of anonymy. Of course, there are crackpots in <laughs> history. He points out and names some of them, uh, some of, uh, some of them with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, Luther, who, in order, uh, who would get rid, of, uh, uh, get rid of rationalism throughout the reason. And then the, uh, the Enlightenment of the 18th century, in order to, in order to get back to the use of, uh, 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 use of reason through our faith. You can't do that. Uh, that. And then ended up, as it were, uh, were uh, fueling the French Revolution. Then came the Romantic period, period in order to put back, back into the picture the mystical, uh, mystical they called it the ro roman uh, Romantic. They got rid of both faith and re uh, re reason. And so on, we come down to the chaotic myth. But what he also notes, and this is the most important point, point these things which are are, are tragically uh, in error, are attempts to respond to real problems, not manufactured problems. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And that at the same time, we have to find what he calls the instances. What is it, as it were, that occasion these crackpot uh, things and uh, 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 fuels, as it were, the revolution? Until we do that, until we do that, we cannot. We cannot make any advances. We're simply, as it were, isolated in our ivory tower, doing nothing to work the salvation of souls. It's a curious thing. St. Maximilian says the same thing in 1933 in his letter to all of the friars in studies in the conventual Franciscan order. He says, one of the great mistakes in modern times, uh, th times in addition to the mistakes of the, uh, of the revolutionaries, was the fact that so few Catholics studied that kernel of truth that was firing them. And until we uh, pick out and understand clearly the problem that they were grappling with in the dark, uh, we will not, in fact, have a very positive missionary effort. We should read that. Uh, we should read that uh, if we can get hold of an English trans uh, translation. He, translation. He is not at all uh, closed in ne uh, and negative. He's saying the same. He's anticipating the Pope. Oh. Oh, it's not true that everybody was uh, thought of the church as a beleaguered fortress and had to remain that way for all eternity. Anyway, on this point, right, right, we want to conclude by simply taking that famous prayer of Pope John, Blessed John the Twenty-Third, opening the council. And we shall we shall see that indeed, 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 the divine spirit did intervene and grant what he. Uh, what he asked for. Divine Spirit, renew your wonders in this our age as in a new Pentecost, and grant that your church, praying perseveringly and insistently with one heart and mind together with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and guided by blessed Peter, may increase the reign of the divine Savior, the reign of truth and justice, the reign of love and peace. Amen. This gives us that prophetic vision that is so much uh, a part of of uh, the Franciscan uh, spirit, uh, uh, the genius of Saint Francis. We remember Blessed John the Twenty Third was a uh, was a Franciscan uh, tertiary member of the fraternity in in Padua. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in Padua. Uh, uh, in Padua. We can see what we have said, why it is so important to defend Vatican II, to accept it, to try to live it, uh, uh, live it work for its uh, true implementation, uh, because it is the great blessing that was granted in, uh, uh, in response to this prayer of the Holy Pope, 
who began Vatican, Vatican II. Praise be Jesus and Mary.